stuff and then we'll get going. Um, all right, everybody, welcome to the uh, the pro Buddy Hammond training question and answer session hosted by the American Spikers League. We'd like to welcome Buddy Hammond, world champion, national champion, uh, friend and and uh, spokesman for the ASL 2023 Spikers playoffs. So welcome, buddy. Hey, I'm excited to be here. This is a uh... This is going to be a really fun event. Honestly, it's, we've been talking a lot in depth and I'm excited to kind of give more away as to what that's going to look like. But yeah, I'm uh, grateful to be here. Grateful to still be in the sport and be working with you guys on pushing what's next. So really stoked to be here. That's awesome. And again, I'm Alex Hart. I'm one of the, one of the founders of the ASL and, uh, and, and with us as well. Caleb, another founder over here in Idaho, Boise, Idaho. So we're excited. To, we're excited to, to talk more about the playoffs question and answer as well. So as we go through this, this is how this is going to work. We're going to go through some, some really unique, interesting uh, details about how the squads playoffs, the strategy, the tournament structure, uh, the prizes, the, the winners. There's more than just the three winners that you think of. We have division winners, all that stuff, how that works. We are also going to be giving away a free hotel stay at the Hawthorne Suites next to the playoff field. So that's going to happen today on this call. And then we're also going to spend some time with a uh, pro uh, world champion, national champion, Buddy Hammond, who's going to give us some, some insights. And then you guys have a chance to ask him direct questions. And so we will tell you how to do that when we get to that point. So stay with us. Stay tuned. We're going to go through some details on the playoffs. And then we do want you guys to ask questions about those as well. So if you have questions, just put them in the chat. Caleb and I will get to those. But without any more introduction, stay with us. Let's get into the exciting details of the playoffs. Sweet. Um, yep. Perfect. So uh, obviously the big thing, $22,000 in prizes. We've had a lot of questions about how this money is coming up. Mostly how tournaments are run is they say, you know, if we get X number of participants, we'll give 60% of it away. And, you know, that's not really a good guarantee for players to show up, right? They um, so for us, we just said, we're just going to put the money out there and whether we, we lose it or we gain it or whatever, it doesn't matter this much that we round it needs money flowing into it. And how that split up is in two ways. One is the sponsorships. So the winner of premier women's and challenger, um, will the seven players on that squad, the ones who win it, they'll each be sponsored by the ASL and we will pay for a route for a full expenses paid trip to an STS event of your choosing within the U S and, um, and we'll, we'll cover that. And then everything that's left over from that will be a cash giveaway to the individual players. So each player should walk away with, you know, three to $500 on top of a, that, that sponsorship, which is really awesome. And, and uh, it's a good way to, to, you know, we want to send these players out. We want people to not have to pay to go to an STS. So that's, that's on our dime. So. Cool. Uh, obviously there's going to be hundreds and hundreds of players there from all over North America and Europe, and we're excited. This is going to be a large event, large event. And so I know those that have committed to come are super excited. So this call should get you even more excited. And for those who are still deciding whether or not you want to come, you're watching this recorded or you're watching it live, uh, stay with us. We're going to, uh, give you all the reason to save some money, fundraise some money and ask mom and dad for some money to come to this event because um, it's not every day you get a chance to experience something like this. And this is to start off the 2023 season. This is going to be a fun, exciting, adventurous event. And so we're excited to, to get you guys all there. So what we're going to do now is we're going to, we're going to, we're going to show you, I'm sure most of you seen this video, but it's a little 40 second clip to get you excited. It's got some fun music, some highlight videos from Buddy and Clark. And, uh, and so here we go. Uh, let me just get this all. Okay, here we go. We can cut that out here in a second. Hold um, on, that's not the one we want. We want this one, right? Sorry, guys, technical difficulty for a quick second. We can cut that. Okay, we're just going to show it right here.
right. So, yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. So we want you guys in the highlight reels, not watching the highlight reels. So let's make sure we get you there. All right, Caleb. All right. Some, this is so sensitive. Okay, right. There, there we go. Man, that's sensitive. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, uh, we've got, you know, we had 120 squads um, registered as captains. Obviously, some people aren't going to be there able to make it, but we do have a large representation from a lot of states. I know California's got, I think, like, five or six squads coming idaho's got 13 you took has got third like three or four um uh who's got oh texas has got a ton too so basically the idea is lots of representation from canada as well we might have one team coming from europe um it's it's going to be an event that is going to be well covered and there'll be a lot of players that you wouldn't normally get a chance to play against um and have a chance to win against as well so that's awesome so we're going to go through right now this idea of the, how the match works. A lot of questions about that. This is different. This is unique. And this is one reason why you should bring your squad. Um, and the question is, we get this a lot. Well, I've got five guys or four guys or four girls that are really excited to come and they're good. But our six and seven, they're still developing. They're still learning how to play. Should we bring them? And after we get done explaining this to you, the answer should be absolutely. <laughs> we're trying to grow the sport, grow the program. Imagine spending two days playing in this tournament um, as a new or, or advanced or, or beginning to learn how to play player. And uh, and you'll see why they're not, uh, this is a good place for them. They don't need to be as advanced as you think they need to be to win games. Um, so Caleb, let me pull this screen up here and let you, I'll run computer, you run. Okay. So, so um, how this works is, let's get, you can grab the bar if you want, Alex, that'd be a lot faster. There you go. Okay. Um, so uh, if you grab that whole thing, Alex, and reduce the size of it, so select everything and just make it smaller, you should be go. able to. That's, far, that's, that's right. Here we go. Okay, that's fine. All right, here we go. So um, you have your squad. There are seven people on the squad, all right? That's the big question. Well, normally squads have six. You have seven. So how this works is you have seven players. You are going to rank your one through seven. Okay, so if you're number one, you're two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, the other team will do so as well. Um, round one, you are going to send out your players. Okay, so you can mix and match as freely as you want. So let's say you send out your one and your four on a net. And then you say, okay, we're actually going to sub our seventh player and we're going to put our five and our six together. And we're going to put our two and our three together. And I don't know what the strategy behind this person is, but they just said, you know, we're going to do that. They now have created a pair score. So you add the two rankings of your players together, the one, the four, that's five, so on and so forth. Um, and now the other squad gets to match. The, the first rule is you leave and write the pair variance plus or minus three. So the players can ma mix and match their players to match the, the pairs that were just sent out, um, but they have to be within a certain range. So with, for a pair score of a five, they couldn't exceed a pair score of eight or go under a pair score of uh, two. Okay, so, so I'm gonna I'm gonna be the black squad here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna match Caleb's road Caleb's uh, placing. So I can go two to eight on this one. So I'm gonna put my three and my one, and that gives me a pair score of four. So I'm within the variance. So that's that's an okay matchup. Uh, I'm then going to put my five and my seven together. And that gets me a pair score of 12. And then I'm going to go, I got to be in a pair. I got to be the same as the round one, two to eight. So I'm going to put my, I can't put my four and six together because that gives me a 10 and, and that's outside the variance. So I'm going to go ahead and put my two and my four. As you can see, that gives me a pair score of six. So all three of these pairs are within the variance. And they can now play. And what's cool about this, as you can see, they're all somewhat competitive, at least on paper, uh, versus, you know, me putting, like, what if I put my one and my two against the five and six? Well, that's a pair score of three to an 11. That's very lopsided. So these are going to be somewhat competitive. 
um, which is why we say like, if you're going to bring your seventh player or sixth player who may or may not be at the same skills as the rest of the squad, it's okay because there's going to be some opportunities for them to play with different players on your squad against similarly skilled matchups. Perfect. Thanks, Alex. And with that, so this is round one. You play your games. Their games are at 15, cap at 15. And um, each net one is worth a point. So let's say blue sweeps. They win all three. Okay, 3-0. Now it's round two. Now black will send out their teams. And then uh, blue will match. And so there's this, uh, what this does is there's a lot of strategy. Okay, so a weaker team could have a better competitive strategy or a better lineup or better matchups or whatever it is. And they could take games. You're all just, you're just trying to go two and one at the very least. And if you go one and two next round, you're going to go two and one or go or try to sweep. And so there's, there's all this interplay. You get to play as a team, which is the funnest part about this. It's not just, Oh, I have a, my partner. I'm playing with them all day. I'm playing with my one. I'm playing with my seven. I'm playing with my three. I'm playing with my four. So it rewards those players who like would never get a chance to play with those guys. Um, but also creates more team unity and you guys all should have the same game plan. Now, the question was just asked, Caleb, um, should squads bring alts in case of injury? So the answer is yes. And, and this is kind of how it works. So this has been some questions. Uh, you, It's a seven player squad and no, not eight, not six. You're allowed to bring seven. You don't want to bring eight because that's a disadvantage because now you're subbing out everyone. You want to bring seven, that means three of you don't sub, four of you will, which allows kind of a starter mentality. You can kind of keep some consistency to the strength and core of your squad. They can anchor or play together. You don't want to bring six because if some, no, there's no rest, there's a lot of matches being played in this tournament, which we'll get to in a minute. But also if someone gets hurt, uh, you now have to forfeit a match. So if you start, everyone has to bring seven. Now if someone, for whatever reason, gets sick, the airline tickets won't let them come, then you're showing up with six. So seven have to be registered, six could show up, I suppose. But if someone gets hurt in the match, now you're forfeiting a, a game throughout the rest of the match. So bring seven. That's that's does we, we want seven in case that does happen. Nice thing about round net is the likelihood of an injury is reduced significantly compared to other sports, but it still happens, unfortunately. And uh, so this will give you some opportunities to rest players and and have some good rotations. Uh, this is the match format. Uh... Does anyone have any questions? If you if you have a question, just raise your hand. You can unmute yourself um, about the format. This would be actually a great place to stop and ask questions here. Anyone? If not, we will move on. Okay. Oh, someone does. Go for it. No, no, I said all good. <laughs> okay. Okay, no worries. Um, basically, the, we'll, we'll kind of move on from here, but the whole point of this is right now we're kind of in a state where once you get premier, there's not really, um, uh, you still want to be on the same, oh, I guess you can look at the software. Yeah. Um, there's not really a point if you're premier and you, and you don't have a chance to get to pro after some point, you kind of lose your self feel sense of self value and you, and you kind of stop playing. That's where we see a lot of people leaving is after they realize they're not going to get pro or something like that. Um, and, uh, how deep does 15 hard cap go? um to 15 yeah yeah so you yeah sorry just to answer that question you played 15 cap at 15 each game you have three games per round um and you'll have four rounds so you're going to play 12 games there are a lot more there's a lot smaller obviously a lot quicker um but because you play so many it makes up for that you'll be wasted by the end of the day um okay. but yeah, behind, I mean, go ahead. sorry so so back to this point uh premier players they're kind of losing um their incentive. So by, by having your community bring seven people and having to dig deep non-premier and premier, it kind of creates this longevity for someone who wouldn't perform very well in a premier tournament, maybe get knocked out second round. Now they, they actually have a chance to win and succeed as a, as a squad of seven. Perfect. Awesome. And um, you want to talk about the software here? Yep. And we have, it, that may seem complicated, all the stuff we explained, but we have a software that will and will not allow you to do certain things. So it makes it super easy. You just drag and drop the name and it'll tell you, oh, you can't do that because of this. Um, so should be pretty simple. Awesome. Okay. So now we're going to turn our time and attention. I'm going to go over the playoff structure. How does this tournament work? And to Kayla's point, we've all been to these tournaments. You lose early on and you go home. It's frustrating. So fear not. 
This is going to be worth your time, your money, and your efforts to make it happen, to recruit your squad, bring your community. Don't be the program that doesn't show up. You know, come be a part of this. And this is why this tournament is so stinking cool. You're going to start. There's three different stages. There's the seeding stage, acts like a pool play. There is the... Um, there's the stage we call branch play, which is kind of the, the kind of the interchange, trying to get the best spot. And then we final, we final, sorry, we turn to the end. We finish with the championship stage where everybody's can kind of a four squad championship to kind of finish out their division and two semis and a final. So the way it works, it's pretty simple. We will seed you into a group. There'll be three squads per group. You'll play the other two squads and you'll have a record. Some will be two and oh, one and one, or oh and one, or sorry, oh and two. Based off your point spread, how much you won by, we will then take the whole entire tournament, rank them from top to bottom, and then we will sort you into four different squad uh, branches, we call them. So you'll be sor sorted into four different branches branch A, B, C, or D. Inside each branch is what we call a level. The level one, two, and three. So the higher you seated, the, the higher the level. Level, you go on level one. The, if you went 0 and 2, you might be on level three. And uh, if you went 1 and 1 with a good point spread decently, you'll be on level two. The levels do matter, but they aren't, aren't, aren't essential that you get on level one, two, or three at this point. Now it's a matter of winning. So you will then, when assigned to a level inside the branch, we have the first set of games. Now there's three sets of games inside branch play. Set one you will play everybody on your level. Level one, you'll play everybody in your level. And then you will then get ready. That will determine set two. So if you're in level one and you take second place, you will stay on level one for the second set of games. If you finish last in your level after that first set of games, you will go down a level for the next set. And of course, if you take first place in your level, you will advance or level up to go to the next level, as you can see here, these examples. Well, what happens if you're on level one and you win level one? Well, that's great. You won't play with, with that same guy that stayed, or the same squad. You will now switch branches with somebody else. So all the winners of level one will switch and play as level as the top of level one in a different branch. If you're the bottom of level three and you lose level three the worst the, the, the lowest play, player there low squad you will then switch branches as the third place squad of level three in another branch so we have a lot of movement happening so we don't have the same outcome every single time so the point of branch play is to be on level one going into the final set of games and then at the very last set of games you will this is how this is what happens. So you play that, that third set of games, of matches. If you are first place in your branch on that last set of rounds, set of games, you will be invited to play in the semifinals for Division I. If you're the second place squad in your branch, you will come together with the other second place squads from the other four branches to play in Division II and so forth. And I go down all the way down to the many squads we have. And this is, this is based off of 84 squads, um, this, this version, and it's subject to go up or down depending on what happens. Uh, but the idea here is that you will be playing in a semifinal and a final depending on how you finish branch play. So even if you are the seventh, you're on the Four, third level but you win that third level in the last set of set of games in the branch play you're going to be playing for a division and you're going to be playing for a semi and a final and we have cool awards cool t-shirts we have cool whatever we can get we got a lot of sponsors we're getting and fun stuff to give you so you're going to walk away with a medal gold medal your division champion and you're able to go back to your community and let them know that you won the division that you got assigned into the championship stage and of course, in this, the championship stage, you'd be playing two semis and the winners of the semis come up and play in a championship while the losers of the semis play in a third, fourth round game. And that is how that works. And the winners of Division One get the prize money and the scholarships, or some of the scholarships, the, uh, the, the sponsorship deals and some other cool stuff we're hoping to announce. So 
Any questions regarding the tournament structure? So you can see this is well worth, this is different. Um, you're incentivized to finish out the tournament. And, uh, and so we have these cool championships for everybody along the way. So it's, not, it's, it's unlike other tournaments you've been to. Okay. So any other questions? As you transition. Yeah. As you transition, I'll just add um, that. Um, how'd you guys come up with this? <laughs> great. Well, um, that's a great question. Alex and I have very different opinions on how competition should work. And he's a, he's a liberal and I'm a conservative in this way. <laughs> um, but uh, basically it was just this, this idea of people losing or doing bad in pool play and then playing the first or second seed in the first round of bracket. And then as constellation bracket goes in most tournaments, no one wants to play with Caleb in constellation. They say, I'm tired. I want to watch this. I want to watch that. Um, we want, and, and, then, and there's no reason to play, by the way. Why would you play? You're, you, you, you lost your chance to win. So the idea behind this is we wanted to create a format where you could play the whole time and you could, will have a reason to play for something. And um, this also gets you a chance to play against a lot of different people and uh, hopefully provides a, a better experience. Not that th there's, two there's two different types of, we just hope that this is a different experience that people will want to do more often and have a, and be more bang for your buck. Great, great answer to that. And uh, you didn't pay to try to win. You came to play around it. Now, if you win, great. But sports is not about gold medals or nothing. So um, I, I just we just got tired of hearing people leaving early from tournaments because they didn't they lost their first round play. It's like I don't know how you're going to get better. <laughs> so we want to grow your programs and develop round net players and grow the sport. So this is a tournament structure that does that. Okay, cool. Caleb? Um, schedule. Yeah. So schedule. Uh, Friday start check in starts at 7 a.m. till 8. The tournament starts around 8. We might push that a little later, but um, you'll play to 6 and then Saturday, 8 to 4. Um, seems like a lot of playing time, but how that works um, is um, you will play one to three games and then have a buy for an hour or a little over. Um, everyone will kind of be on a different schedule, um, but you'll have lots of breaks. So on the first day, you'll have three hours of break time and Friday, or sorry, Saturday, you have three hours of break time as well. Um, and uh, that gives you opportunity to rest, uh, gives you opportunity to actually go and watch, you know, a match that you want to watch. Um, it also gives you an opportunity to observe. So we're actually paying observers who during their, their downtime want to, want to observe. We want, we, the goal is to have an observer on every single match at every, in every single division at every single level. So if you, and we'll, and we'll let those opportunities be made known to you, but yeah, if you want to observe um, during your off time, it makes a little extra money. We will pay for you to do that. So. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Right, just about there. Um, talk about this next two slides and then we're going to hear from buddy Hammond, world champion, national champion, super excited. So, all right. So don't, I mean, we talked about this before, but we hopefully you share this video when it's recorded and it's playing, we're replaying this, send it to people. If you're getting excited about this, you want to come. You don't have to have seven superstar. This is not, it's not how it's not how we build a sport. It's not how that works. Everybody is at a certain level, certain place, give them an opportunity. This type of a format is built and designed for a, a skill set like this to come and compete. Uh don't miss out. Uh, it's a chance to grow your program. It does take effort. It does take time. It does take money. It does take some fundraising. It does take effort, but uh, you're, you're not going to regret coming. I can, I can promise you that we've done youth nationals this way. We've done leagues. We've done state championships. We, we, I'm telling you right now, this is going to be one of your favorite tournaments to come to. And uh, if you just knew what we knew, um, so just come, we're going to do this again next year in 24, but you get an automatic inv invitation by coming to this year's um, and then next year we have some qualifications and some sort. We'll release that a little bit later on the road. It's going to be bigger. There's going to be an all premier division. We're going to call a pro division and we're trying to get $30,000 in that division for the champions. We're trying to reward these programs that have deep, deep growth, like cool stuff happening, but, but we need you to come to this one and make the effort this one so that we can grow and that we can have the next one. And so big things happening. Uh, anyways. Okay. Get your people there. And last slide. Uh, 
yeah, fundraising. Uh, don't want to spend a ton of time on this. It's it's pretty simple. Um, first off, as far as flights go, if you're going to if you're planning on going to two to three STS events this year, our bet is that this event is going to be the cheapest flight. <laughs> that there's no there's no airport in the world that has cheaper flights than Vegas. And especially specifically for this weekend on the days and times, if you fly in Thursday night and you fly out Saturday evening around seven or eight, it's going to be pretty cheap. Yeah, from Canada, it was looking like a 150 round trip. Um, from the, from the East Coast, it was looking like 200 round trip. So um, definitely, uh, you know, if there's this is going to be a cheaper flight if you're going to if you're planning on doing multiple. Um, as far as fundraising goes, kind of the simple, easy part about this is, you know, none of us get a get not none of us, buddy, got a chance to go to worlds, go to go, go to worlds and experience this kind of this kind of community. Um, but a lot of us don't get that chance. Um, and so it's kind of presents a unique thing where, you know, you uh, or I, Caleb, have been selected to go and represent Boise, Idaho and, and play in this um, playoffs. And so what I do is I create a GoFundMe. I send it to my loved ones. I say, hey, look, I've been selected um, to represent and, uh, and it's a really cool opportunity and I'm playing on the big stage. And I think that will resonate a lot. We did this with our youth. Uh, for youth nationals and each person was able to, to fundraise enough to make it not only financially viable, but sometimes have a little extra spending money as well. So another thing to consider is obviously sponsors. If you reach out to, you know, local companies and say, Hey, we're going to Vegas to play in this awesome big event. And it's awesome and amazing. Um, that obviously can go a long way as, as well as just tournament fundraisers. But the real thing is just, do I want to come? Do I want to experience this? And if that's the case, um, your community be willing to, to figure out um, how to raise this money. That's the big thing. It's just the desire to do it. So. Okay. Awesome. All right. So we got spots. Um, they're there till they're there. So right now we're telling you there's some spots. So if you want to come, if you haven't registered yet on Fuego, go do that. And then we'll send you a link to where you register the seven person squad and submit your roster. Um, and then if you have already registered on Fuego, then just go to that league apps link we sent you. If you need more, let us know. But there's there's still spots, and so come come make come make this come make history come make history with us. Uh, okay, now without further ado, now it's time. <laughs> we don't have you clap, but we can hear you. So, uh, but we are grateful and honored to spend this much time with Buddy Ham, and it's been a treat and uh, all, constantly inspired. And so we are going to turn the time over to world champion, national champion. Uh, Buddy Hammond to do some trainings, presenting, and question and answer sessions. So, Buddy, the time is yours. We'll do the drawing here in about five minutes when you have a little break, and then we'll go. We'll go from there. So, thanks again. Time is all yours. It's it's still so weird to hear you <laughs> announce me as national and world champion. Like it's been ten <laughs> years in the making. Never expected to be in this position, um, but I am grateful to be here and to be working with you guys. For you guys that selected me to be part of this. And for you guys on this call, I'm grateful you're here as well. And I just wanted to first say how excited I am about this event because I've played a lot of tournaments, maybe not as many as like David Gonzalez or someone who has like hundreds and hundreds and is playing one every other weekend. I've played in a lot of events over the years and it's all been two on two. And same thing. If you lose early, you're like, ah, do we have to play out for fifth and this and that? And like, this is a big deal. Like you could be the winner of division two, II, division three. And that, that says something about you and your squad and the people that you bring. Um, so I'm very excited for the opportunity to play with people that I've never played with. And it's already led to some really cool experiences in my community, which I didn't realize these people were as skilled. And I'm questioning, how are you not premier? Like, have you just not gone to the right tournaments or whatever it is? So I'm, we're bringing some, some fun people that I'm excited to get the chance to play with. And based on the world's experience, we got to support each other as a squad, which was one of a kind, you know, we won our matchup and then it came down to are the other teams going to pull their weight. So I'm excited for people to get to experience that as well. Um, but in terms of giving you guys something useful, you can apply to your game. Obviously I'm well known for defense and mindset and things like that, but I want to give you something that hopefully you can imagine even without seeing it drawn out. But one of my favorite positions to start in is when I have a right-handed hitter to my right. So that means Clark is on my left serving across to a right-handed hitter. 
I'm on that hitter's left hip already because what does a right-hand hitter want to do? They want to hit the ball hard. They want to hit a boom, a pull, a push, something of that sort. You don't really have to go anywhere. And I thought this was pretty common knowledge for people that are playing defense, but I've been playing with a lot of people pick up lately that will just vacate that position and expect the other person to fill that gap. You need to learn how to be that player, right? expect that that person's going to walk up to the net and hit a big right hand. Granted, different players have different tendencies, but someone I was playing with the other day from that was in that position from when I served, they ran to the opposite side behind, just expecting them to hit a flick. And they had never played against this partner so or this person. So to assume that they have a flick is a lot more, it's a lot less likely than someone coming up and hitting a right hand. Now, this is, might seem very simple, but the reason I like that position is I can just shift with the hitter. So if they shift towards me, I stay to the left of them, expecting it to get the, the big right-handed pull. And if they shift away from me, I can just go chase them down a little bit. The other thing I love about this position is you have the vision. There's nobody in your way. You don't have to worry about a setter getting in your way. You don't have to worry about the hitter getting in your way unless they move a lot last second. But that's something to consider. Just when you go play defense coming up, if you, and it applies to the opposite side, if it's a left-handed hitter, okay? If your server is on your left and you look to your right and you see a right-handed hitter, you don't have to go very far. I want you to think about that coming off a right hand, get yourself set up as if you're playing catcher and blocking a ball. Maybe you're a big goalie, just get huge and expect that hit to come your way. And if it doesn't come to you on that, learn from, from your positioning and their tendencies where to be. I know Fred was on here the other day. He loves the right hand pull and being way off the net. I'm telling you, practice just being in that position, get excited, expect to get a touch there, but just coming to the net, staying on the left hip and getting low and big at the net. So hopefully that gives you something to think about defensively. I know that might seem very simple, but just be conscious when you're in that position and tell yourself, this is the best chance I have to get a touch because the vision is good and I know they probably want to hit a right hand. Yeah, hopefully... Yeah. Hopefully that's a that's that's some sort of knowledge. If you have questions specifically about that, ask away. But that is that's when I'm feeling most confident as a defender. And if you watch my content, a lot of the times, whether it's Rahul, who I know is just trying to blast the right hand, or a Fred or a Ryan Gross, who he is a pretty tricky hitter. A lot of times they go for that big right-handed shot. Just come to the net and take up as much space as you can, shift around and just get in their face and blast that ball to the sky. Cool. Nah, it's great. Yeah, I've noticed that watching you at Nationals. Uh, I came home and kind of revisited that idea that I, I think one way to describe that is you kind of have this target on your chest. It, it appears to me and that you're just mm -hmm. trying to get, like, that, that's your job. It's trying to get that get that contact on. Uh, you get That's your job is to get contact. Yeah. Well, and I'm really that. trying to put my center, right, my body, my <laughs> the middle of my chest in line with where they are most likely to hit. That way, if they make the adjustment a little to my right, a little to my left, I got my shoulders, I got my biceps, I got my hands even further. I'm trying to put the center of my body in the most likely spot that they're about to hit that ball. And if I can do that, then I got everything else to help. Maybe it's a foot every now and then. It's pretty rare. But, uh, yeah, hopefully that gives you guys some something to focus on when you're playing defense next time you go to the pickup or even a tournament. Focus on that specific position. And uh, I would also say a big tip to give you is if you're not filming yourself playing, one, if in case you make a crazy highlight play, you can never recreate that moment. So film yourself. Worst case, nothing happens. You delete it. But film yourself. You can always watch it back and learn from your tendencies. Where are you getting beat? To your left, to your right. Is it usually over you? Start taking that away and make them hit something else. Okay, that's awesome. No, fantastic. Okay, we're going to break for just a second, and then we're going to come back for some questions and some answers. And uh, so, Caleb, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, do you want to have me share my screen? Uh, I would love to give you this power. Let me find where you're at. Gotcha. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Okay, oh, so we're about ready. Just, just, oh, it's on your computer. I got gotcha. you. Um, so we're about ready to announce the uh, hotel. Oh, if you're just coming in, I might have missed you. Uh, okay, I added my, oh, Matt Mallory. Okay. 
All right. I still you, have it. Yeah, uh, you're gonna have to do it. So. It's not okay, I'll just announce it. I'm spinning a wheel. I have a wheel here. Here we go. Spin. And the name is. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. The I got audio. You. <laughs> Okay, Alexander iPhone. Alexander oh, wow. iPhone. That's a that's a crazy last name. It hey, is. that's me. Uh, I'm here. <laughs> what's your last What's your last name? My last name is Kim. Sweet. And what's what doesn't sound like for? anyone wants to. I don't hear anyone that wants to collect the prize. It doesn't sound like he's present. I don't know. <laughs> uh, who you? What What squad are you playing for? Uh, I believe I'm playing for the Mississauga squad. Oh, sick, dude! What the heck? They got. They won the other one too. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's actually someone in our squad as well. You guys this just got two free hotel rooms, so you guys don't have to pay for housing the, for the, one the, night. The lesson yeah. learned is come to these Zoom calls. So I, I forgot to mention that we have one to two more planned. The next one was Gabe Finocchi, uh, doing the same thing. So get everyone there. Uh, you have to sit through Caleb and I, and I don't know one of the greats talk about how to be greater, better and greater but uh other than that you can win a free hotel room I'm pretty sure gabe's tip is going to be something about how you, when you wear neon you're like you're <laughs> supercharging yourself to hit the ball really hard it's going to be something along the lines of that i don't want to blow it for everybody but don't be surprised when that's his tip it, it, it's a wardrobe advice it's to be trained yeah, wardrobe. yeah. <laughs> honestly Here. look good play good it's it's part of it yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, well just yeah. Just so you know, if you miss the prize this time, we're doing two more uh, and two more Zoom calls. Um, we might have a very, very special guest for one of them. We'll see. But we at least have Gabe Finocchi. So um, he's also very special. Uh, but yeah, he's also very special, but not as special as the guy that we think we're going to get on. We'll, we'll see. Um, but so also special, buddy. So now we're going to open up for Q and A. Um, so just a couple things with the Q and A uh, to Buddy. Uh, we want to be respectful of this time, so let's not do any silly, stupid questions. Um, <laughs> we had a couple last time. Um, and then let's make it pertinent that where it's like you can't – it wouldn't just be you ask any random ran out player who would answer. I would say direct your question to Buddy. He's he's good at, at round net. Ask him skill-wise, practice-wise, coaching-wise. But if it's like how far is the center of the net from the serving line, anyone can answer that. So. Just, just, okay, so. Yeah, that's um, a really easy answer. <laughs> it's 102 seven, inches. Seven, yeah, <laughs> bang. See, we all learned um, something today. There we go. Um, so if you have your hand raised, um, uh, Zoom chat, I will call for you to unmute yourself. And then we'll just go in order and have you ask Buddy a quick question. Looks like, Neil, you have a question. Yeah, hey, buddy. And thank you all very much for taking the time. So um, my question is more about um, mindset. Um, specifically, um, you have it going in to the tournament, but then how do you make those adjustments? Like, how do you know um, when you're working with a partner? And I guess I understand it will take some second hand of how, if, you, if it's a new partner or not, but making those adjustments like mid game, when to take the time out, do you kind of like just a prep question right away? And then are you kind of like, hey, don't worry about that missed hit? You know, kind of how much or how little are you kind of um, having that conversation? Thank you. That's that, that's a t that's an interesting question, right? Because there's sometimes that I personally feel like, hey, Clark, we need a timeout, and he'll be like, no, I got this. I'm locked in. I'm like, I trust you. So it, is, it does come down to trusting your partner. But there's also been a time or two where I'm like, Clark, hey, like I need this timeout, and he goes, okay, I I I'm trusting you as well. But generally, if you make a couple mistakes in a row, take time to reset, right? If you haven't if you haven't let the last error kind of pass already and it's affecting your play for the next play or from two plays, take the time out, step away. Or if someone's getting hot on the other side of the net, maybe you're not doing anything wrong, thing wrong, but they're just absolutely beating you with their serves. Take that time out, try to ice them a little bit and then come back focused in. Um, but just in, in terms of overall mindset too, Neil, I think it's important. It's like try to make sure your partner's still having fun, right? If someone has competed and has won, a lot of these events or come up short many times. If I only went to an event to try to win games, I would be missing out on so much of the joy that it, this is for, right? This isn't a job for anybody, even at the top, top level. If you can go in and tell yourself, I'm going to this event to make as many amazing plays and have as much fun as possible. That's going to keep both you and your partner in a really good headspace and generally going to, um, it's going to translate into more relaxed play um, to create those right scenarios. So, Hopefully that helps you out, but yeah, it's just, it's really just kind of feeling out your partner 
And if you can tell they're overly frustrated and say, hey, no, we're taking this time out, but also allow them to take the time and the space they need to work through it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great answer. Um, Joshua Tavis asked in the chat, he says, um, you're talking about serving position. Is it better to just be inside the serve circle or closer to the net? Or does it depend? So when, you, when you're when you're okay. doing defense, it, do you want mm -hmm. are you trying to be as close as possible, or outside the surface circle, or within like distance relative to how close in that where sure. you're trying to be? I think it's it's one. It's dependent on a few different things, right? It's depending on the hitter, right? Are they a weaker hitter, and I can get away with being off or chasing balls down, or is it a powerhouse like a Ravi? where it's like you're not chasing that down even if you had 10 steps to start, right? So it depends on their tendencies as a hitter, but playing at the highest level, my mindset is generally start close to the net. And then if I see the set is off and it's going to be a one-dimensional hit because when you have a centered set, you can go pretty much any direction, right? The further off the set or further off the net the set becomes, if it's way over here, this, the hit has to go onto the net and one directionally to the other side. So as the set gets further away from the center, I can also do the same. Obviously, that brings in my partner to have to cover the drop or I'm responsible for the drop. But generally, it depends on the hitter's tendencies and the distance from the middle of the set for me being close to the net or dropping off. Sweet. Awesome. Great answer. Yep. That's a really good perspective. Um, Jake, Martha, you have a question? <laughs> yeah. Hi, buddy. Uh, What's up, Jake? I know that you're a pretty big gym guy and I just have the question, uh, do you have any like drills or exercises that you recommend that you do at the gym? Like every other time you go, that will help improve you maybe in defense that you think, okay, this is the drill that will maybe strengthen your core, your, your speed or your arm mm -hmm. strength or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it almost sounds like you're setting me up to plug my training program because I have created something that is specific to getting better at the sport, which to be honest, it's not generic per se, but in terms of overall health, I think it's important to be doing all of the things that are in this program, which a lot of it does come down to taking care of your body, making sure you're not getting injured. So we're stretching a bunch of things of that nature. Um, but when I hear the word drill, I think specifically practicing the sport. So serving drills, one, two, three drills. When I think of training and exercise, I think of being in the gym and doing chest presses, rows, things like that. But one that I will give you, um, it's kind of weird to try to demonstrate it, but essentially it's, it's, a, it's a pow off press, P-A-L-L-O-F for anybody that wants to look it up. You get a cable machine or a resistance band or something, and it's an anti-rotational movement. So what that means, you're pressing away from your body and the resistance is trying to pull you one direction. So it's trying to pull me this way. So when I press straight out, I'm keeping my core engaged to not rotate, anti-rotation. Now that seems like, why would I want to anti-rotate when the sport is all rotation? We're working the same muscles as a powerful rotation, right? So this is good for boxing. It's good for golf. It's good for obviously round net where you're getting your hips involved and you're firing the hips, but we're not doing it in an explosive um, type of exercise. We're doing it in a, in a calm, controlled press, hold. And then if you want, if the weight is on this side, you can always rotate further to get a little bit extra rotation, a little bit more movement to work those muscles. It's also really good movement if you know anyone's struggling with lower back pain, because when you train your core and that's nice and tight, again, it comes down to having good hips and glutes and hamstrings and all that. It really helps with the lower back as well. So um, yeah, train the core with an anti-rotational movement. That's one that is a staple for me when I'm, after I do my jog and I do my, um, stretching that's one of the first movements i do because to me the core is one of the most important for the overall body thank you yeah great that's jake's actually my training we're gonna go hit the gym right at four so we'll probably do that <laughs> yeah mix um, it up all right I, I have a question that uh yeah i can't find the raise the hand i don't know if i can if i'm the host but uh <laughs> so uh my question is um uh, we, we talked a lot about this with our playoff group. So we had a big playoff party last week and everybody had lunch and we, we, we got everybody excited and something was said last night in response to this idea, which is um, not using pickup as a way to improve, but rather doing other things outside of pickup. What are those things that if a player wants to improve, really wants to improve today, um, what, what are the things 
that I should be doing. It's, I mean, if you look outside my window, we got four, you know, four, four inches to a foot of snow. I'm not out there. I can't mm-hmm. think of much anyways, but what can I be doing right now to get ready for the playoffs to get better? Not, not just aware, but better, better skills. What would you recommend? Yeah, there, there's so much that comes to mind, right? We talked about watching yourself play, right? Reviewing your own film. You could watch the pros all day long, but if you're not that person, you're not living that same point. Whereas when you watch yourself back, you can kind of remember, oh, when I, I remember on this point, I shifted here because I thought this was happening. Watch yourself. And if there's someone specific that you are trying to beat in your community or in a tournament, watch that extra, right? That's me versus double clutch. We, they've beaten us four times. We've beaten them three. But the times that we've done our best, me and Clark sat down and we watched film. We learned their tendencies and we went, why are we in the positions we are? And one of the, when we beat them in Atlanta, we beat them good 21 12 21 18 something like that it's because we watched film so that's one if you're struggling with your mindset and that could even be you're just super nervous when you're out there find a way to decompress i meditate every single morning because it just puts me in a better headspace and that translates to everyday life um write things down as to why you're playing the sport what do you even want to get out of it um but otherwise it's strength training right for me strength training um, doing stretching, making sure your muscles and your body is capable, which is my whole thing right now. I've been playing long enough to know the sport. Now it's how long can I keep my body physically fit to be in the sport? So I'd say strength training, stretching, watch yourself play. Those are some of the main ones um, that I would recommend. Nothing really jumps out um, otherwise, but I mean, you can hit serves all day long, but if you're overdoing it, you have to listen to your body. Maybe take a day off to again, do some strength training, watch some film. Um, yeah, something of that nature. Hopefully that helps. Great. Also, uh, I, I wanted to reflect that. on this earlier real quick too. Um, talking about that defense position I mentioned earlier, people have referred to that as lazy defense. I think it's just being smart and energy efficient. Um, I don't know if this is going to help, but I did try to draw it out. I was so small. Um, here's Clark. He's serving across backward it might even be backwards on zoom i'm trying to show clark serving across i'm here just walking to the net so when the hitter comes up they're hopefully going to hit my direction that probably made it worse for everybody watching and i wish i might not have done that but again right-handed hitter on your right walk to the net and let them hit it into your body that looked great no it looked really good we could see it really clearly cool awesome cool and you can always go back and screenshot it and really dissect it if you need. But and I, I hope again, I hope it's not backwards when I show it to the camera, but we'll see. Yeah, and I'm loving it. Sweet. Um, our good friend AA. Uh, You're good to go. You probably don't recognize yourself as AA, but your hand is raised. Unmute yourself. Go for it. All right. You had it. Okay. Well, yeah. all right. Anyone else? <laughs> Anyone else uh, want to ask a question to Buddy? This is a rare opportunity. We'll, we'll probably do two more and then end it there. Two more questions. No such thing as a stupid question. I've asked no such thing. Plenty. We'll all learn from it. I promise. Oh, Mike isn't working. Oh, yeah. type okay, it in go the ahead chat, and type it out. um in the there, meantime anyone else yeah there was one question we missed and i don't think we covered this but buddy when you're watching your game playbacks when do you typically watch it the next day or do you want to sit for two or three days uh, it depends if it's a specific play that's like bugging me i'm like what did i do or something exciting that i want to see i'll watch it right away um sometimes it just depends on what i have going on but generally it's when i'm making the highlight videos which is another great like it's so funny because the plays that i do well in the right create the touch i'm seeing that play so many different times when i'm creating the highlight video because i'm trying to go back and figure out where it structures been and i'm watching it back and forth so i'm learning what does work um and so the things that i'm doing poorly i don't see as often unless i'm watching a full game playback and specifically trying to see what went wrong but more often than not i'm priming my brain to do more of the same when i'm creating those highlight videos so that's something make your own highlight videos even if you don't really share it Make it for yourself. Keep it somewhere so you can reflect on the good moments. And that's also creating positivity in your brain going, oh, yeah. When you start thinking, I suck at defense, just show yourself that. You've made the play. You've done it once. Even if you make one play a tournament, that's better than zero. 
Okay, sweet. Here's the question from Neil. Do you have a spreadsheet filled with DC tendencies or wristband <laughs> like NFL no. QBs? Mental, I got a mental spreadsheet for sure, but it's it's all it, it's it's fairly simple for the most part in terms of what I'm trying to create. It was really just talking to my partner, figuring out where we both need to be to create the best opportunities. And we got a ton of touches in the finals. Granted, it's windy of a day, they didn't play their best, but our game play um in terms of defense really paid off for us. So sweet. Okay, uh, here we go. Uh, Alex Gonzalez, clearly we'll do this and then the iPhone and then we'll, we'll cut it there. Um, cool. Clearly you are a very defensively dominant player. Do you think the sport is more about predicting or reacting? It's Prediction both. or reaction, um, what's more important? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's prediction first, reaction second. Right? So I'm, I'm anticip I would say anticipating more so versus predicting. I'm anticipating this, but I'm not committed to it. Um, again, yeah, it's really, I think their tendencies are this, so that's what I'm starting with. But as soon as I see a set that says otherwise, I have to react and I have to adjust, right? So um, if you're just guessing, which again, that could be something where you could get away with it. But if you're guessing for one specific shot when they have 360 degrees to work with, you're granted probably going to be in the wrong place a lot of time. So it's good to uh, predict but not assume I'm trying to think like the verbiage, but yeah, you got to think that they're doing something and then adjust to the opposite. But if you, if you're just going in and being like, all right, let's see what happens. You're going to get beat most of the time. You have to be very intentional and that's uh, not to plug too much. That's something I'm trying to break down in a defensive course that I'm going to talk about. It's going to be a lot of me talking to the camera, a lot of me breaking down gameplay and defensive footage and um, strategies and how the game's advanced and things like that. So if you are more curious in these things, I'll be posting about it. And um, yeah, I'll be taking questions in that and adding it into the course. So it's going to be very much like interacting with the people that are investing and spending the time to learn this. I want to give back to them and make sure you guys are getting your, your questions answered. Sweet. Yeah. Hey guys, sign up for that. Sounds awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So iPhone with your hand raised, go ahead and unmute yourself, ask your question. And then we'll get to A, then we'll call it good. iPhone hand raised. Unmute yourself, iPhone. Hey, buddy, this is Gib. I, I might say iPhone, but my yeah, name is Gib Layton. <laughs> so um, I've heard two different defenses schemes, which is both players move to the right, or I've played server and tracker, and the tracker either goes around or he hits in the blind spot. What's your favorite defensive strategy or what you usually do a lot? Yeah. And, and again, this is, it's really hard to answer this in just one with one uh, response, right? Because every player you're in a different position, really it's about knowing the four different positions that you're in, in relation to where your partner is as well, which I'm going to break down in the defensive course. But back in the day, it used to be the opposite of what I kind of explained before is my favorite position would be, see if I can do this properly. My partner's on my right serving to a right-handed player across, in which case I would wrap around the hitter to that right-hand pull. Now, there's still times that you'll see me do that, and that's typically when that hitter rotates too far in front of me. Then I'll shoot around. Um, but what I've been absolutely loving, which I'm going to be running with Max Modell this weekend, and people can hear it. They can know it's coming. They're still going to have to adjust in real time, is – after I serve across to a right-handed player and my partner's on my left. So that could be Max, one of the fastest players, most dynamic players. If I'm serving across to a right-handed player, in order to have the best vision, I'm getting around the setter as quick as I can, watching the set development and then shooting in there. Okay, so it's very similar to getting myself in the position that I explained where I'm just standing here and the hitter's on my right. I'm trying to get myself into that position. So I'm trying to get 90 degrees and get around the setter Granted, there's times where the setter or the first touch doesn't allow you to get behind the setter or around the setter, and you have to wait for the set to come and then shoot through. But mentally, I am anticipating trying to get to that spot and take away the pull, and then Max would be following me a little bit. And again, he could be following me a little, but if he goes too far and that hitter jumps around, it creates a space. So as he reps in front of Max, then Max can jump behind, and then I'm on the push. It all changes so fast, and I know I'm trying to give you a ton of information, but again, these are in-depth things that I want to give you guys with examples that you can see and learn from. So again, if you're interested, come learn from me. I'd love to work with you guys. But uh, does that does that kind of help you out there, Gib? Does that? 
Yeah, that helps. That helps. Yeah. I know. Sure. I know you said both players go right, which I guess is kind of what I'm explaining with if I go around the center and Max follows me a little bit. Um, but again, it's all situational based on the hitter's tendencies. And maybe that one of the players is just playing a better defender and you're trying to, I don't want to say force, but you're really trying to make sure that that's the person creating the touch because the other person can't chase it down or has worse body defense. So those things come into play, which are all things I want to cover um, more in depth. Yeah. Thank okay, you so final much. question, buddy. Yeah. But Thanks for asking. Okay, so in terms of game composure, I have a problem staying composed in the last few points in the game, and it usually costs my team to set. How do you stay composed in the last couple points? That's, that's when the pressure is the highest, right? And that's when you have to perform. It doesn't matter what happened to get you to 18, 18, 19, 19, or point 19. I've blown it a couple times where I all I have to do is put one away and it lifts up and they break us and then beat us in extras. It's happened. I've had it where I've come back from a 12-6 deficit against wonky sauce, right? The, the sport is always going to have moments that are for you and against you. That's just the way of life. But one thing that comes down to just resetting and getting your composure, I think it's, I think it's called a physiological sigh. You'll see me do it if you watch film in these high pressure moments where I'm, I'm getting intense. Um, you want a certain, a certain amount of anxiety because that gets you focused, right? When it gets past that breaking point, then it, it sends you down a rabbit hole and you're out of your body. There's a way of being out of your body and just in the moment that's positive. So you want some of these anxieties, but if you feel it becoming too much, you do a double inhale. <sighs> the shoulders come up because you're filling up your lungs. Everything comes up and then you, <sighs> you can shake out your arms and you can even do it now. You might feel like you're a little tense watching this. I challenge you guys, if you're watching this, do a <sighs> in through the nose twice. Big exhale, shake out the arms and just reset. Reset breath. If it's still too much, call timeout. Sometimes calling timeout is too much because then you're in your head over here thinking about it versus just staying in the moment. But try that sigh. Try to get your composure. If it's an anger thing, maybe just try to find a way to become more at peace with the moment, which can come from meditation and just, um, just remember you're like you're doing your best and you can learn from it. So try that big breath in. <sighs> Feel the shoulders come up. You'll see me do it if you watch the Wonky Sauce series. You watch me in Worlds. It's something that I consciously do to reset my nervous system and then try to get more centered. That's all, dude. That's that's really good advice. Really good advice. Speaking as one yeah. who has felt that anxiety take me over the top and mm -hmm. sabotage oh, yeah. all my skills and all my practice and all my hard work because I couldn't handle adversity. Um, I mean, I, but it's also, it's something to be said, you have to get in those experiences as often as you can. So it becomes more of the norm or, you know, how to react in that. And that, that doesn't mean you're in a national championship or the world. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're just playing pickup and you're like, I want to win this game so bad. You feel yourself getting too tense. <laughs> work on that breath. Breath works powerful. Yeah, no, it's, it's all, it's all part of the plan uh, to get better. Mm -hmm. And I, I appreciate that. And I will say this one last thing in closing. Um, we're at nationals, <laughs> buddy Hammond, you're in the semis. You're down three points. If I remember someone comes we were down five at one point, I don't know about this. Specific yeah, well, I think, it was, I think you were, I think you're down three or four. I say three just because I can't remember, but was, I think it was actually yeah. four. It was like 16 to 19 or 15, 18 or something like that. And it was the second game and you lose this game and you're done. Uh, someone comes over the tent and tells us what's going on, that buddy's in trouble. And I'm like, there's no way. No way. So I, I come over. And I was like, I said, no, like I'm going to put a hundred dollars down that buddy wins this game. They're like, you're crazy. This is like, cause in spike balls, we all know around that, that it's a compression of time in some sports. You have time to come back, especially the sports that you have to serve to score, for example. But in this one, it's rally scoring time is against you. And I was like, no, no winners win, but he's going to win. So we came over there and you put on the best show in the history of round net that I have ever been able to watch. And not only did you come back, and win you had to win twice because of a, of a reserve which may or may not have been there doesn't matter but you had to win twice and then you went on to win the next game and then of course you won that comes sunday and i remember talking to you during the break you're like watch get ready for a show like get ready because your mindset was so strong mm -hmm. and such in a great positive spot but having talked to you you're, you're there was never doubt that you were going to win and I just remember having spoken to you between those matches, uh, just that was a testament to me about where you've been and where your mindset is. And so everyone sure. listening, watching, uh, we, we saw this and we saw him do it, come down from four points or whatever, four, three, five points and win. 
and carry that momentum all the way through that adversity. And of course, he had to lose to get there, I'm sure. So, but thank you. Oh, yeah. Again, I've, I've been on the losing side of that. But even in those games that I've lost, my mindset's been the same. I, I tell myself, I'm not going to lose this game. I'm not going to lose this point. I'm going to make, I'm going to make this touch. I'm going to play so clean. All those things are going on up here. As soon as you start losing control of this and you say, oh, I, I messed up that last set or, oh my God, I'm, I'm so nervous for this next set or I wonder what serve he's going to hit. No, get out of there. Just say, just tell yourself, I'm going to get this received. Have a little smile on your face or, all right, re I'm going to react to the ball. And then just get like, that's it. Just tell yourself the positive things. Because as soon as you tell yourself, oh shoot, we might lose this game. Even if that might be the truth, even if you're down eight points and you're probably going to lose, what, where is the incentive at all to you telling yourself that you're going to do that? That's going to make you play worse. You've already lost. One, one mentality I've had too is it comes back to having fun in the game is I tell myself, even if I'm down a ton or I don't think I'm going to win, I just want one more chance to make a cool play. I want one more cool piece uh, of highlight cool. content because no one, when they watch that, the only time they know what the point is at is if you say, this was at when we were down by seven points. Otherwise, I have no context to the play. I'm just like, wow, what a crazy play that was. So that's something to consider too. Just keep yourself in a good place and know that's that, that you aren't done yet. You have one more chance to make a cool play. You have one more chance to do something cool that could live on forever. That's great, man. Great advice. Well, that being said, thank you. Uh, world champion, national champion, uh, Buddy Hammond on the call with us. Thank you so much uh, for all of you watching um you, here's your cool this is the little secret if you have an opportunity to come to the playoffs and play in premiere as a non-premier player i'm going to tell you something there is a chance an opportunity that you will be placed on a game against buddy hammond okay and you have the chance to no touch ace me it's happened by people i have no idea who they are and they just come out and fake me. i'm like oh okay, nice. this is the <laughs> only tournament in the history of round net that or this big of a tournament to be able to have an opportunity not only to play him there's a good chance to beat him uh as you know probably won't happen but you have a chance <laughs> so, good anyway, mindset good mindset there yeah. get the mindset there uh if nothing else make a cool play and make buddy go home saying dude that guy was awesome so anyways this is a cool opportunity to come play against uh great pro premier players um and get better yourself you know get that experience in so with that said thank you buddy We'll see you in Vegas. And uh... <laughs> someone says they're going to claim world champion. Status. I'll give it to you. I'll, I'll, I'll send you my gold medal and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, guys. Okay, take so that back. Okay, yeah. okay, we'll see you in Vegas. Thank you so much. Have a good one, guys. Bye, guys. Bye.